Well, it is my pleasure to be here today. Mississippi and First Baptist Church of Starkville has made me and my family feel entirely welcome. We're learning that this is the state that is known for hospitality, and so far the fine people in Starkville here are not disappointing us, so thank you all so much for welcoming us and uh, bringing us to this moment. It's really a joy and a privilege for us to be standing here today. If you have your Bible today, and I really hope that you do, take it and join with me in Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, and today we'll just be looking at the first six verses. But as you're turning over there, consider this with me. The Bible says that hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, it's one thing to hope. It's another thing to come to the realization of those hopes. And so I want to ask you this morning, what are you hoping for? Is there something that you are hoping for maybe today? Something that you're hoping for maybe coming up by the end of the year? When something incredible has been promised, waiting can transform into weariness. I know we're all tired of hearing about it, but we are currently in a pandemic. I can't wait to see some of your faces. I see half of your faces. I can't wait to see all of your faces. It's especially difficult for me. Uh, names sometimes are challenging, so just be patient with me. But faces, I can always remember a face, and just quite frankly, it's hard to remember half a face. But anyway, we're all tired of hearing about the pandemic, but uh, it teaches us so many things in this moment about hope. Katie and I and the family, we, of course, watched the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and it was a big letdown without all the millions of people there. Football, if I'm honest, has been a little bit boring because it's just not been as exciting and dramatic. Uh, baseball, they've tried to do things by putting in cardboard cutouts, but it's just not the same. Professional football, they've piped in the noise, but it's just, it's just not the same. But relief looks like it might be inside. I don't know if you've heard the news yet, but through God's common grace and providence, a vaccination is on the horizon that has been promised to be 95% effective in its treatment of the virus. And so suddenly, when people hear that news, it's like frost, on a, uh, frost in the morning when the sunlight hits it rising from the rooftop. People are making plans to get back to normal. Hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And so what I want to do is I want to take you to a moment in Scripture that teaches us to hope in God. And that passage is Genesis chapter 15. And let me tell you, God laid this message on my heart during the time that your pastor search committee, which by the way, what a great group. They asked me early on if I had any concerns or questions about First Baptist Church of Starkville. And I told them, I said, unless you guys are not representative of the rest of the church, I don't have any questions and concerns. What a great group that uh, was the first face of First Baptist Church of Starkville. But this text, God laid it on my heart about the time that your pastor search committee and my family were praying about this moment of the uniting of our hearts together. And let me just say this right off the bat. It's going to be very difficult for me this morning to not overly personalize the text. But then again, this is a trial sermon. And I hope that you'll get a glimpse of not so much of my heart, but a glimpse of the way the Lord has been leading me and my family during these days. And please understand the importance of this. I have to realize this, and I'm really preaching to myself at this moment. I realize that this is a trial sermon. I realize that. All the emotion that's associated with this moment, there's no reason to act like it's not what it is. Do your best, individuals say, uh, and they're right. I should do my best here in this moment. But here's what I realize. There is something greater at stake in this moment than the vote that's going to come at the end of this sermon. Of first importance is magnifying, exalting King Jesus through this moment of proclamation. 
So this sermon is going to be very personal, but uh, this sermon will be effective in the end if you're able to say, what an awesome God we serve. So I invite you, hopefully you've had plenty of time now to find Genesis 15. I invite you to let's turn to Genesis, and from Genesis, let's learn about Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord from Genesis 15. So I'm going to read the text, and then we'll say a prayer, and then we'll continue on into the sermon. So hear the word of our Lord, Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear God in heaven, thank you for this moment, this moment to stand before these individuals to make much of Jesus. Lord God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, may Christ be glorified to the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a song when I encounter this text. There's a song that comes to my mind when I think about this text. It's a song by Fanny Crosby, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Who have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my God? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith to Him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. And then if that line wasn't good enough, she said it again. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. 2020 might have been a rough year for you, but listen to me. It hasn't been a rough year for Jesus. He is still king. He is still in charge. And all of our hope is in Him. And if you're not hoping in Jesus, it's my prayer that today you will hope in Him for the first time. And if you've already hoped in Him, it's my prayer that at the end of this sermon you will realize how beautiful it is to hope in Him, and hope will continue to rise higher in your heart than it's ever been. You see, there's this faithful God who stands through the ages. As He led Abram, He's promised to lead you. But listen, He's just not promised to lead you. He's promised to be with you. He's promised to never forsake you. He's promised to be beside you as He is within you, to guide you as He provides for you. And His call all through the ages is the same. Trust me. Trust me. Through my life, I have felt the hand of God gently leading me. God gave me a dream, and He brought a desire to me through His own doing of putting others who had the same desires and dream, and that is to to tell the world about Jesus. And then in my own story, God sent me to the wilderness for training, for teaching, for teaching me that all that matters in this world is Jesus. He would often remind me that I am but dust, and then He would reassure me that He knows that I'm dust. He remembers my frame. And so all through my life, I felt this gently sustaining, leading God who would never let go. And He'd never let the desire to know Him and to make Him known cool in my affections. Instead, it's like He stifled them 
like a fire, Jeremiah would say, burning with inside of me to know Him and to make me known. But often in my life, people would come to me and they'd say things like, God is going to use you, or you're anointed. I can't wait to see what God does all uh, through your ministry. And all the while, as those people would say that to me, I would remember what the Bible says. The Bible says the fool believes every word. But I would also believe what Jesus said in John 2 when folks would come to him and uh, at the Passover feast because they they were believing in him because they saw all the signs that he was doing. And the Bible says about Jesus that on his part, he didn't entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. So when people would come to me and they would say that, I would appreciate it, but eventually The words of encouragement and affirmation became a nuisance to me because I would hear them, be thankful for them, but then look at my circumstances and say, God, what are you going to do for me? Miss Kathy said in her report that what drew her to consider me was Isaiah. And what she didn't realize was I wasn't supposed to preach in September. I was supposed to preach in July, but because of COVID, things got delayed. And so I remember writing in my journal as I was preparing Isaiah, I remember writing in my journal that Isaiah is going to change things. Now, I wasn't sure what that meant. Katie and I, we'd been preparing to leave our present place We've been praying for God to open a door that fits more with our desires, and I wasn't sure if the change God was going to bring was going to mean another place to serve, a place that more fits our desires for proclamation, or if it was just going to simply mean that God was going to bring me closer to Himself. Either way, I was confident that God was going to work. Either way, I knew that God was going to work. And and then one night, I took a phone call from the committee chairman, Kevin. When he said they wanted to move forward to bring this moment about. And I received that phone call as the moonlight was coming through the Georgia pines, and it was like my God saying to me, Count the stars. Now I know that I'm not Abraham, but I do know that I serve the God of Abraham. And if God can cause the faith to arise in the heart of Abraham, He can cause faith to arise in my heart. He can cause faith to arise in your heart. And listen to this. Not only can He, He wants to. He desires to do so. And so the theme of our entire time together hinges upon this truth. God is faithful. God is faithful faithful. He is our hope. Listen, not our circumstances. We don't hope in our circumstances. Our circumstances are liable to change, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will provide. But it's not so much about Him providing as it is not so much about what He does provide, so much as it is about Him being the one who provides. And whatever He provides, even if it's difficult, is exactly what we need as we're ensured that what He provides is He's taking us and He's molding us and He's making us fit for His service. I'm competing right now with a friend, a, a fitness challenge through uh, Apple, my Apple Watch here. And there's some days, if I'm quite honest, that I would rather not go literally that extra mile in order to beat Him. But there's some days that I need to do it because it makes me fit. And when we're fit, we're better. So consider for a moment, God, consider for a moment this truth. God has an amazing plan for you. The God of the universe has an incredible plan that includes you. He doesn't need you. The Bible says if His people don't praise Him, then the rocks will cry out. He doesn't need us, but He wants us. He desires us. And through circumstances, what does God do? He forms in us a heart that is humble and recognizing that every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And what is worship? Worship is that moment when we come to learn to delight in Him. 
And so to learn these truths, we turn our attention again to the text, to Genesis 15. And to understand Genesis 15, we have to understand what brought Abram this far. And so look at chapter 15 and verse 1, for example. It says, after these things. So I'm so glad that we have chapter divisions in the Bible because we understand just by logic, we're entering the narrative. There are 14 other chapters that come before chapter 15, right? 14 other chapters that come before. So we're entering into the middle of the narrative. Genesis chapter 15, something had to lead us to that moment. And so the Bible says, after these things. And you say, well, what on earth are those things? And so just very briefly, if you have your time here in your Bible, go back all the way to Genesis chapter 1 to see what brought us here to these things. We're going to move through this very quickly. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28 says this, that God blessed the man and the woman who He created in His image. And He said to them, listen to this, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the every living thing that moves on the earth. And so, in other words, God's mandate for those that He created was to fill the earth, to multiply. And then in Genesis 2, very briefly, you look at Genesis chapter 2, and there's God creating the garden, and the garden has boundaries to it. And then chapter 3, of course, comes. That's the fall. And chapter 3, but look at chapter 3, even though in the midst of all sinfulness, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 comes. And this is important because God in Genesis chapter 3, after His humanity sinned, didn't just simply say, I'm done with you and start over. No, He didn't. He promised that He was going to redeem. And so we flip ahead very quickly to Genesis chapter 6, and we see in chapter 6 and verse 1 that every desire of man was evil, and so God still, uh, even though sin had its way with humanity, God would still stop at nothing for redemption for the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 12, very quickly, we're moving very fast. Genesis chapter 12, we see that the Lord said to Abram, go, from your country, your kindred, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Land is a connection back to Genesis chapter 2 where we see the boundaries. And listen to what he said. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that all the earth will be blessed through you. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will dishonor and in you. Listen to this. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So now do you understand why Genesis 15, he said, what, all the families of the, I don't even have a family. But then keep going to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, here's where we begin to slow our pace and to dig in just a little bit. Look at verse 9 very quickly. We see this battle with Kedolomor, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphael, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Eleazar. And then verse 9 says, four kings against five. Verse 11 calls them the enemy, took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then verse 13 through 16 very quickly tells us that Abram, the Hebrew, defeats the nations and delivers Lot. And then look at what happens in verses 17 through 24. Abram meets a king, a king by the name of Malak Sadiq, Melchizedek. He meets this king of righteousness, and he brings out, believe it or not, read the details later, mark it in your Bible in verse 18, Melchizedek, of all the things that he brings out, he brings out bread and wine at the end of a battle. But notice the detail. We learned that Melchizedek is not only a king, but he's a king priest. And notice the details here. God, the creator of heaven, look at Melchizedek's blessing in verse 19. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high. Listen, listen to look, look this next phrase, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then look at what Abram does. He gives him a tenth of everything. And then what does Abraham do, or Abram? What does he do? He refuses to give the nations an opportunity to say that they helped him. And he wants it to be clear. Look at what he says here in verse 22. I have lifted my hand. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God, the high possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread of your sandal strap or anything, lest they should say, 
I, the nations, have made Abraham rich. You know what he's doing there? He's showing that all of his hope is in God. Abram is hoping in God, and in that hoping, it displays itself in his depending upon God. Do you hope in God this morning? Many of you would say yes. Well, what in your life is showing that you're depending upon Him? The Bible says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Do you really believe that? Unless God leads First Baptist Church of Starkville, no point in going forward anymore. And so, what I want to do is after those things, now we understand the phrase of Genesis 15, after these things. After amazing success, after meeting Melchizedek, after hoping in the Lord, after all of those things, we see God coming to Abram. About two decades have passed between the call and what we have here. Two decades of trying to have a child. Two decades of holding on to this promise that he left his home, he left his kindred. Two decades of all of these things, and then then he comes to this moment. After these things. And the first principle that I want us to learn from this story is, listen to this, God will not let go of those whom He calls. He will not let go. He who began a good work in you, listen, He's going to complete it to the day of redemption. He is dedicated to you. He has dedicated Himself to you. That breath that you just took in, even though it was hindered because of the mass, you owe that to God. He's dedicated to you. He will not let go of those whom He calls. Look at this. This great God gives Abram exactly what he needs, which is the second point that I want to take you to this morning for you to write down. God will give us exactly what we need when we need it. God is aware of your circumstances. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows right where you are. In all of your weakness, He knows that you're dust. And listen to me carefully. He loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. You see, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ holds two truths before us at the same time. And both of those things are simultaneously true. We are more flawed and sinful than we realize. And we're more loved than we could ever imagine. Both of those things are true because of Jesus. It's worse than you think it is. But God loves you more than you could ever imagine. God will give you what you need exactly when you need it. Notice what Abraham needs They're not riches, they're not gold, but he needs the Word of God to come to him, to guide him, to assure him. And let me say this, this is exactly what you need to. This is what I need. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise, as the old Irish hymn taught us, thou my inheritance now and always. What does God say when He comes to Abram? And what does Abram say to God? What are you going to do for me? God says, I just told you, Abram. I love the way the NIV translates this. Instead of saying, your reward shall be very great, the NIV says, I am your reward. The the focus of the text is, is that God is exactly what Abram needs, and this is exactly what you and I need too. No substitute will do for us other than God's Word, which takes us to the third principle we learn. Number three, God gently guides His own. And let me just say this. I'm so thankful that He gently guides His own. His guiding is gentle. Think about this. All the way, 20 years. But here's this faithful God who comes to Abram in the height of of this moment where he defeated these kings. But God knew that in his heart he wasn't satisfied. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision. And what's the first thing that he says? Don't be afraid. What would Abraham have to be afraid of? He just defeated 
the kings who defeated the other kings. But God knows his heart, and he gently leads and guides his own. Listen to the preacher this morning. God's delays are not God's denials. God's detours are not dead ends. Those pathways that we may think are unnecessary are probably part of the journey that God has to take us so that in that journey, God can mold us and make us into everything that He wants us to be. God's generosity towards Abram is, listen, not about Abram accumulating things and stuff. Instead, what's it about? What's God after? He has the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't care about possessions. What's he after? He's after the heart of Abram. He's after the, uh, taking the heart of Abram and forming in Abram the heart of a worshiper. And what's the heart of a worshiper? The heart of a worshiper is one who delights in and depends upon God for all things. Not only delights, not only depends in, but delights in that dependence. Delights in that dependence. Are you there yet? Some days, if you ask me, I'd say, oh, yeah. (laughs) Other days, oh, me. (laughs) I'm not there yet. But that's okay. God is there to gently lead and sustain us. Listen, I'm not sure what you're waiting on this morning. No doubt all of us are waiting on different things. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's test results. You're waiting on these things that you know could change your life. But here's something that I do know. Death is coming for every one of us. Regardless of a vaccination, regardless of a pandemic, death is coming for every one of us. But listen, the hope of the gospel is that those who believe in Jesus, even those have victory over death. And so the question that I want to ask you this morning is, do you believe in Jesus? Do you hope in Jesus? Are you depending upon Him? Listen, God is faithful. God can raise the dead. But the question is, will we trust Him? Will we trust Him? And not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and then the next year and then the next year and then the next time and then when good news comes and then when bad news comes. Will you trust Him? Waiting is difficult. But waiting, listen, is the crucible that God uses to fashion and refine us and fit us for His will. God desires to use you. And He's dedicated to His purpose in your life, and so He will. What does God say to Abram? Look at the text again. Don't be afraid. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. Those that cling to the Lord, to the word of the Lord, will in faith have each circumstance, will face each circumstance with confidence that everything that comes their way, listen to this, everything that comes your way has been allowed by God to come your way. And even if it's difficult, God will take those circumstances and use it in your life to fit you into your will for Him. The question for you, the question for me, is will we trust Him? You say, I don't want to wait. You say, I don't want to go. You see, but trusting in the Lord when you say, I don't wait, I don't want to go, I don't, I don't, I don't, all of those things, they become, my God shall supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. All the doubts, He comes in and He gently reminds us through His Word that says that He will accomplish everything that concerns us. I trust Him. Now, that doesn't mean that we understand it. God never said, I want you to understand everything. 
He said to Abraham, go. And then he, 20 years later, comes to him. And then he, the promise still isn't fulfilled in chapter 15. He didn't say we had to understand it. You either trust him or you don't. It's as simple as that. And notice what God tells Abram in verse 5. Look at what he says. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And then look at verse 6. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted to Abram as righteousness. Number four this morning, and finally, God gives us all that we need. God will give us what we need when we need it. He gently guides His own, and then fourthly, God gives us all that we need. Not only does He give us what we need when we need it, He gives us all that we need, all that we need. It's no wonder that Paul, often when he would write, when after reading Genesis and other texts in the Old Testament, he would break out in song when he was writing, and he would say to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And then he would say, Amen. In, or in another place, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all, how will he not also with him generously give us all things? He who would not withhold his only son for you, for you, for me, of course, he would give us all things. What did God give Abram? He gave him all that he needed and more that he needed. How did he do it? And we don't have time to look here, but how did he do it? Look below the verses, verses, especially verses 17 and following. God gave him righteousness, and the way that he did it was through the shedding of blood. You see, here's the gospel right from Genesis. God gives us righteousness through the shedding of blood. The righteous God gave Abram, the righteousness that God gave Abram would come through God giving his only son, who, by the way, was also a son of Abraham, as a complete satisfaction of sin and the fulfillment of all righteousness. Jesus died on a cross so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. He shed His own blood so that by the shedding of His blood, our sins could be forgiven and God could give His righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ to us through Him. God made the Son who knew no sin to become sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. And so here's the whole point. Here's the whole point from Genesis 15. Here is this rich warrior who has the respect of kings, but yet the true desire of his heart can't come from any other source. His wife is barren. We learn that his wife is barren back in the first pages of Genesis 11. His wife is barren, and yet God promises him a son. Do you see how vulnerable Abraham is? How vulnerable Abram is? He can't earn anything from God, nothing he can do on his own efforts. He can't change his circumstances. Instead, he is weary, and he's broken, and he has nothing to give. And let me say this. Listen carefully. When you realize that you have nothing to give, then you're ready to receive all that God has prepared for you. Abram believed in God, and what did God do? He counted it to him as righteousness. What does that mean? He gave him something greater than what his heart sought. God gave him righteousness. And isn't it just like God? Isn't it just like our good God to not only give us what we need, but more than we need? It's time for you this morning to let go of that thing that you've been seeking. 
and just start trusting. Turn your affections, listen, turn your affections away from things and turn towards Him. God Himself is your great reward, and there is no substitute for Him. If God can create the world and the stars, if He can cause a barren womb to give birth, if God can give His Son and raise the dead, then is there anything too hard for Him? He is worth your complete and total trust because His blessing, His blessing that He promised will last forever and ever and ever. May you seek Him today, and as you do, you will realize that it's not so much of your pursuit of Him, but His pursuit of you. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear God in heaven, how we love you, how we're grateful for the way that you gently lead us and sustain us. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would cause faith to arise in hearts. And maybe one today for the first time, may they say, all of my hope is in Jesus. For others, Lord God, maybe that one whose hope has been dwindled and stifled, may today the Spirit provoke in their heart this hope and fully trust in God. Thank you that you are our great reward. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen.